Yeah, when you race every weekend and uh, you're like, ah, I don't want to lift this week because I don't want to be sore for the race this weekend. But, well, you're racing for the next 12 weekends in a row. <laughs> so. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of coaches on couches <laughs> being slouches let's try a new one there <laughs> well improv yeah let's try a new one That's all right cool, it's, it's been a few it. weeks for us uh we almost had, forgot what we're supposed to do here yeah we we're we're kind of falling over ourselves here we uh, even setting up the show Took a little while longer. You're probably wondering why now, and it's because we fell out of the top 50 in Brazil. It, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just kind of a, it's a really kind of a punch to the gut when mm -hmm. you when you fall out of the top 50. Worked that hard. We worked so hard. That and we're like out of we're out of Australia all together. <sighs> we're sorry, Aussies. I know they're just getting and, fired up too. We're still we're summer's up. hitting them right now. We're hitting okay in Spain still. Spain. What the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all right. Anyways. All right. So today we're going to talk about should you or should you not lift heavy as an endurance athlete, cyclist, runner, triathlete, whatever you are. Um, we'll kind of talk about that today. Mm -hmm. Heck of a topic. It's one of my faves. Mm -hmm. Coming from a, a strength and conditioning background. Oh, don't give it away, Dale. Um, well, I've got some pretty, pretty harsh opinions on it, I would say. We'll touch on CrossFit. <laughs> Not yet. I am Coach Dale Sanford. And I am Coach Bryant Funston. We are the co-founders of BPC Performance Coaching, where we specialize in helping time-crunched athletes optimize their busy schedules so they can maximize their athletic performance. Every BPC coach is trained in our Five Pillars coaching system that has been developed over the last 11 years through our work with athletes of all ages and ability levels, from fresh off the couch to world championship competitors. You can find out more about BPC by going to buildpeakcompete.com, checking out Facebook and YouTube at Build Peak Compete, or all up on that Instagram at BPC performance. Got it. I was really trying to enunciate that. I saw that. I heard that. Just trying to get some clean, clean speaking. Got a, got a Unique face, New York. face for podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, we're going to get into topics of today, but first, as always, shout out. Shout outs. We got some backed up shout outs because yeah. it's, been, it's been four or five weeks. We're going to miss people. We're going to miss them. Yeah. We apologize if we missed you there. But um, I will say um, Chris Watts, we've, we've shouted out to him several times. Chris Watts, several weeks ago, uh, was fourth overall at the Deep South 70.3 triathlon. Dropping Watts, baby. Dropping Watts. I yeah. like it. He had a good race. And Great he's name. actually uh, about to, uh, he's going to Galveston one more, one more race this year. That's actually going to happen, supposedly. Yeah, is it for sure go? Yeah, it's so, so far, far it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Tony Gambrell is actually going to go to Galveston. Okay, which I think is going to be his first race of the year. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've got several people. I've got people doing um, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, the full and the and the half. This is their first race of the year. Yep. And shout outs. I know uh, I did my second race of the year. Just this past weekend. Yeah, I think this was my first race of the year last weekend. Yeah. Second race, uh, first race, not much racing happening. Not but good ton. to see that it's actually, you know, returning a little bit more more to normal. Uh, but shout out to Brad Harriman, Hart Robinson, David Collins, John McCann, Coach Dale himself right over here uh, for knocking out the Chinkapin Gravel Grinder over in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Did a little camping and stuff as well the night before. Cross the finish line yourself there. My, I crossed be fun. I crossed it feeling like death. Uh, I did too. It's never good when you look down at mile 28 and you go, I'm wrecked. <laughs> it was... Uh, there were some heavy hitters. You know, shout out to course. the, to the uh, All Sports Productions mm -hmm. because they really did as far as 
you know, um, COVID protocols and stuff were on it. Yeah. You know, we were wearing masks on the start line until yep. about 30 seconds before they said go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so they, they had it dialed in, I would say, yep. as far as that goes. And they uh, had the, it was the, one of the best marked courses. I've oh seen. yeah. 109 miles. The course mark. I didn't miss fantastic. a single turn, and I couldn't get my shout down, shout at, to Wahoo for it not pairing properly with my ride with GPS course. I'm still mad about that, but well, my Garmin worked great. I didn't need it <laughs> because it was it was marked so well. There were so. a couple times where I was like head down, mm -hmm. like just cranking it, and like on a long straight section, and a turn would come up, and if that was I, solo, just in case you're wondering. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got, I was in no man's land uh, from about mile twenty five on, mm -hmm. trying to chase a group of four up the road. Um, but yeah, I mean, it the Garmin beeped at. I set it to beep at me fifty meters before the turn, so I uh, <laughs> like last minute. Yeah, well, it was long enough to like head up. I could pick my head up and see, yeah, uh, see the turn and, and not miss it. Well, that's good. So I almost hit a deer though. Came very close to hitting a deer. It sounded uh, like the deer almost hit you. It, it did. It did a little third base slide right in front of my little front Pete wheel. Rose, little Pete Rose yeah. action. It was so crazy because I saw it and I, I called it out. And then I was like, please don't come into the road. And then it sure took a took a Louie and uh, came right out of this. But then realized it was in a bad spot mm. and it tried to check up. And then it was like a dog on a hardwood floor. You could hear its hooves just going. <laughs> and then it's just like. Trying to get traction. Then it's, <laughs> Traction wasn't there. Then the back end just went out and it slid butt first right in front of my, <laughs> my front wheel. Felt like slow motion. It felt like it. Uh, I was like, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go over this deer and then get run over by 80 people. That would be a shout at too. That'd yeah, be a shout at the deer. Yeah, I would have had to, but I survived. Yeah, it was a, it was a hard, fun, challenging. It's fun now. At the time, yeah, it was not so fun. Uh, also, shout out to Scott Newberry. Hit some uh, PRs, all-time power PRs, uh, during the Ride to Rosemary sprint action. That's that's impressive for him. So Scott's been a coached athlete for what? Yeah. Nine, Since ten years? 2000, yeah. Ten years, 11, something like that. I think. Yeah. Hitting ten. peaks, man. Yeah. I like it. All right. All right, let's hop to it. Oh, hop cycling. Speaking of, <laughs> that was not, <laughs> was not planned. Let's hop to it. Yeah. Hop cycling um, is open. Yeah, registration's open. Registration's open. You can register at hopcycling.com. You can get all the details, but you know the short Cliff Notes version. Do they still have Cliff Notes? I have not. Short Google search. Do you, do you need Cliff summary. Notes these days when you have I the don't internet? Think so um, we're dating ourselves here. <laughs> Cliff Notes version. <laughs> it's uh, something we've done past ten years and uh, proven results live in uh on online we'll action, say we've been using demand. zoom before zoom was cool yeah we've been hitting zoom for a while now uh, but go ahead and check it out we're here to answer questions uh over any of that but if you're looking to make big gains this off season on the bicycle um yep. whether this, you're a cyclist or a triathlete this or world. a gravel specialist or yep. a mountain biker yep. uh if you've got an indoor trainer and you can open an app Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can make some solid gains while the while the weather's crappy and the days are short. Yep, and great great for motivation and accountability. So check it out, hopcycling.com. All right, <clears throat> so Brian, we're to our topic. Finally, How long did it take us? Uh, it's like <laughs> it took us a hot minute, eight nine minutes. I don't know. For those that are still here, um, so the question is: Should you, as an endurance athlete, lift heavy first before you answer the question? Let's talk about he what is heavy. That's a relative term, right? Because we've got um, when we say to some endurance athletes, mm -hmm. "Hey, um, what are your thoughts about lifting heavy?" They say, "Well, I've got like fifteen pound dumbbells in my mm -hmm. house. Those mm -hmm. are pretty heavy." Mm -hmm. And we'll be like, "That's not what we're talking about. That's not quite the heavy we were thinking." No. Now, that may be used as you progress towards heavy. Sure. But 15 pounds in and of itself, not heavy. Not exactly. Not heavy. 
So what we are talking about when we're talking about lifting heavy, generally it's a lower rep count. So you do uh, more sets, lower rep count. Mm -hmm. um, and the let's say the last one to two reps of your set are a challenge. Yep. And then when you get to like the last like set, that last two, those two last two reps, there's a possibility at times of failure. Yes. Let's just put it that way. Not like you're blowing a knee out. Yeah, yeah. Muscular. You failure. just won't make the lift. Exactly. And if you follow safety precautions, that's going to failure is not a bad thing if you're prepared yes. safety wise. Exactly. Um, people do it all the time. Yep. We're not talking about lifting high rep to failure like a bodybuilder. We're no. just talking about you can't actually finish the the rep that you're on mm -hmm. because the weight is is so high. Yep. <clears throat> so that's kind of what we're talking about. When we're talking about lifting heavy. Uh, and and notice, the, I will say, notice we didn't say anything about speed of the lift. No. Um, this is key. That is another topic altogether. Yes. Uh, and this is where we're going to talk about CrossFit. Yes. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. So the, over the year, like, we've been fired and fired and fired questions about CrossFit all the time because there are a lot of endurance athletes that enjoy both, uh, you know, doing, like, doing endurance athletics and also doing CrossFit. Competitive environments. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Social competitive environments. And yes. uh, a lot of people misunderstand me when I talk about CrossFit. I don't dislike CrossFit. Correct. I think CrossFit has done great things for a number of people yes. on top of bringing more um like um just making awareness oh, to yeah awareness bringing more awareness to olympic lifts mm -hmm. and stuff like that mm -hmm. which are fantastic yes uh, um big fans yeah don't like yeah don't mistake we are lifting. huge fans of olympic lifting um but the problem that sometimes comes in is not CrossFit, the modality, it's the coach that is leading the way. And so when speed gets put uh, at a higher priority than technique, uh, and when the weight is not necessarily determined by the athlete, it's determined by the workout, uh, that can turn into problems. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I have issues with some CrossFit coaches who and put the speed and the weight prior before technique. Yes, because Olympic lifting is very technique specific. Absolutely. The demands on making sure form and technique, and we're going to get to this, but is it's paramount. Like You have to learn how to do the movement first before you even think about going heavier with it. Or you're gonna you're gonna get hurt, and that's where our problem has been is yeah. that we end up having athletes that get hurt because, and it may not even be the coach; it can just be that environment you're in, sure. where everyone's hyping each other up and everyone's trying to push to the limits all the time. Um, and if if you're trying to balance that with also doing a you know stuff on the bike or the run or the swim. Um, yep. You know, we're, we would much prefer our athletes do the Olympic lifts, increase your weights, progress those. Um, but the goal isn't to every time you lift to go full gas, all out. Let's see how many reps I can knock out in a, in a short period of time. Um, let's go to failure on everything all the time. Uh, eventually something's going to give. Yes. And just piling intensity on top of intensity, exactly. Generally, without recovery in issues, without recovery. So generally, what we see is the people that do that, even the ones that can handle the CrossFit workouts being mm -hmm. super high intensity, when they get into doing high intensity running, mm -hmm. uh, not so much cycling. It's usually running is the problem. You get in high, high intensity running, and issues pop up mm -hmm. because it's just. Muscle damage after muscle damage after, you know, stress on the break tendons down, and break the bones. Down, break yeah, down. it's all yeah. breakdown and no recovery. Yeah. Um, so that was a long explanation about CrossFit, which is not what we're talking about today. But um, there is a, there's a big difference. The point we want to make is there's a big difference between lifting heavy and doing Olympic lifts. 
uh, because Olympic lifts are focused a lot on speed of the lift. Um, and that's like, you don't have to get to that point to get the benefits of lifting heavy. So we just kind of gave up our, our, uh, our whole answer to the question <laughs> in that whole spiel. But the answer is yes. You, you, most endurance athletes are going to greatly benefit from lifting heavy. Um, like the problem is most endurance athletes will not, uh, lift enough, lift frequently enough, or go through a progression where they actually get to the point where it's, it's okay for them to lift heavy without risk of injury. Mm -hmm. So first of all, what are some of the major, other major benefits of lifting heavy? Yeah, and and it's no uh, coincidence that we're talking about this the last week of October. You know, yeah. for most people, you know, it's been a weird season, obviously, but season's pretty much wrapping up for most, which is a great time to start your heavier lifting. Um, reasons for it: uh, increasing muscle fiber recruitment. Yeah, and so on that one, that's a huge one for a lot of people because. Uh, when you get into a full season and you know, lifting heavy has its place. Like it's not, it's not necessarily year round for everybody. You should not necessarily be, you know, slinging weight three weeks out from a goal race. Generally scale back by that. Uh, You know, generally it's going to be more in the off season and even in the early season. And there, I do have athletes that I keep it in there, you know, and then we scale it out about a month out from a, Mm -hmm. from a big race. But with so many, with us as endurance athletes basically going in a straight line mm-hmm. all the time, it is inevitable that Very, muscular imbalances yep. will pop up. Yep. And even some of the bigger, more powerful muscle groups will just fall asleep. Yep. And they will stop working for you. Which I don't think many people realize. Like, you'd think if you work out a lot, the muscles that should be working are going to work like the muscle fibers that should be firing should be doing so but that is not the case at all it is super easy yeah to get very uh dominant with one muscle group during one movement pattern and totally le- neglect uh, all others and eventually that leads to overuse breakdown injury lots of problems decrease in performance you know even if you don't have the injury or the breakdown, just the decrease in performance, what you're missing out on by not utilizing all of the muscle groups that could be participating yeah. in the movement pattern, um, you know, you're missing out there. So, well, and think about think about what we do as athletes. We'll we'll get in an hour, two hours of training during the weekdays. You know, maybe three for those that have the time during the weekdays, and we'll go longer on the weekends. But even if you're doing a five hour bike ride on the weekend that's five hours out of 24 hours what are you doing the other 19 you're you're probably sitting around yeah (laughs) sitting around (laughs) on your butt uh doing as little activity as possible uh sometimes on purpose sometimes it's because your work makes you sit at the desk yeah you're literally sitting on your butt the rest of the day Mm -hmm. not activating those muscles Mm -hmm. so for the majority of the day you are not activating those muscles. So it is not that hard for them to just stop mm-hmm. working. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we do heavy lifting, it forces your body uh, to recruit more muscle fibers mm-hmm. and to have those muscle fibers wake, awake, alive, and well and doing their job. And in general, and we're going to talk about some of our favorite exercises, you're, you're moving through a larger range of motion. So you're taking those muscles through a larger range of motion and you're actually activating a greater number of muscle fibers as well than, than, you, than you would typically. So um, you're working a, a, a bigger movement pattern, um, which is going to be a definite benefit for you and help you keep uh, healthy, but also it's going to help with your functional range of motion you know, throughout, throughout the year. And it does... It does- uh, you know, it f- forces a lot of the stabilizing muscles to do their job as well. Mm-hmm. Because when you start loading yourself up with weight um, and any kind of movement you do like laterally or front to back has to be 
stabilize or counteract, you know, mm-hmm. you know, cause especially when you put weight on your shoulders yep. and your the, it changes your center of gravity completely. So you, a lot of the stabilizing muscles just have to do their job or else, yep. which is another reason why we say we'll get, you know, we'll get into it, but that, why form is so important. Oh, exactly. And yeah. you can't just go into lifting heavy. You there's have to kind of go through a ton of core period. activation in doing a, a back squat. Like there's so much core activation that goes into, into that. If you're actually focusing on technique, yeah. like you should, or you can blow your back out. <laughs> so that's <laughs> yeah. bad. Uh, so neuromuscular connection. So brain, yeah. brain to muscle, and that kind of goes into that, like getting muscle, muscle groups to actually work, actually mm-hmm. fire, um, and and bone density. You know, endurance athletes, especially cyclists, uh, bone density can be a massive issue. There's not much impact. Or very little. The only impact you really get is if you fall off your bike and hit the ground, which is not very forgiving. That's not the impact you want. Not the impact you want. So if you're not stressing your bones, your bones don't need to maintain density. They'll actually lose bone density. And by by stressing them, by lifting heavier, um, you end up stimulating those what osteoblasts that then uh, start building up. Uh, and telling the bone like, hey, we need to get stronger so we don't break in half. So building up bone density um, as you get older, you know, a ton of our clients are 45, 50 plus. And uh, as you age, a natural thing with that is decreasing bone density. So yeah. if, if all you're you do doing nothing is, about it, exactly. And if all you're doing is, is riding your bike and trying to main, maintain cardiovascular fitness, you're going to run into issues uh, down the road and hopefully you don't wreck. But I'm saying typically is it's not when, uh, if, but when you're going to wreck on your bicycle, right? I mean, yeah, hopefully, hopefully not, but, uh, <laughs> it does happen it's from time to time. Uh, it just went south fast. Uh, all right. A few more for you. Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of touched on this one also, but increasing the force of muscle activation. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're increasing, uh, the number of muscle uh, fibers that are being recruited, um, which in turn increases your force production, mm. your ability to produce force, um, you know, to the pedal, to the ground, mm-hmm. to the water, whatever. Um, and then ultimately, when we build up our absolute strength, our maximum strength, that then can be converted to power. Yes. Uh, speed component. Yeah, that's where the speed component comes in. Um, and we're not really going to get into that a ton today, but that's where once you have built up and, and kind of gone through this, what we call max strength phase mm-hmm. of building strength by lifting heavy, that's where we can start to bring in the, the more complex speed-based movements uh, to then teach those uh, muscle fibers to be recruited quicker and thus more force production and more power to the pedal, more yep. force altogether. Um, but you have to get through, like we're talking about several different strength phases here. Mm-hmm. You got to get through a preparatory phase before you can lift heavy. Yep. And then you want to go through at least one or two uh, alt, you know, max strength phases before you start incorporating this, this, the that, faster, more complex lifts. That conversion to power. Yeah, know. to convert that strength to usable power yep um yeah so that's essentially how we lay it out general prep max strength conversion to power strength maintenance once you get you know closer to closer to your goal event and then we even you know kind of taper from there as you get super close to whatever your your peak event is yeah not every event right your goal event. Yeah, when you race every weekend and uh, you're like, ah, I don't want to lift this week because I don't want to be sore for the race this weekend. But, well, you're racing for the next 12 weekends in a row. <laughs> so uh, exactly. we should probably pick some uh, important ones and exactly. focus on those. Exactly. All right. So that's the why. So we talked about the what. Massive benefits. You know, what lifting heavy is. We talked about the why. Like, why should we do this? Um, let's go ahead and jump into like, some of that how yeah so um like we said when you start if you want to start getting into heavier lifting there has to be there one has to be a preparatory period so if you're doing no strength training at all and you just try to go get yourself underneath a a heavy weight and do you know reps of three you're going to be sorry 
Like real sorry. Do uh, not do that. You've heard it here. Yeah. Do not do that. We need to go through a preparatory period that's probably going to last four to six weeks yep. at least of of strong, you know, focusing completely on form and movement and mobility and making sure that all the prime movers are activated, like the big muscles, glutes, hamstrings, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of the hip muscles, core muscles, like making sure they're all doing their job yep. and Waking going through them up. and yeah. able to go through a full range of motion because there are people who try to get into heavy lift. And we just talked about this right before we started, mm-hmm. like doing an overhead squat. Mm-hmm. Like there are a lot of people that don't have the shoulder mobility to do an overhead squat uh, not even close. Yep. And it's going to take them a while to develop that before they should even try it with lightweight. Yes. So yeah, you know, step one for that person is increasing shoulder mobility. It's not going to any sort of overhead squat. Right. And then there's are there are pe- there are a ton of people who and like can't even do a normal squat mm-hmm. without either their knees coming forward or uh, you know they get like a quarter squat and then their back starts to like oh, they, they just that. start to drop their chest and they do that tailbone tuck or they get the butt wink the butt wink yeah like <laughs> a little bit, boop yeah we, you don't want you don't want a butt wink so no. if you can't hold that form yep. on a body weight or a, mm-hmm. a very light squat there is no way you should move up to heavier weights yet and I guarantee you we could probably take ninety at least ninety five percent of uh, you know I work primarily with the cyclists like. Take a cyclist who's done no strength training, take them to a gym, go with just a 45-pound bar, and have them do one set of squats, and they're going to have the jello leg feel yeah. like, oh my gosh. And that's that's that recruitment of muscle fibers that you have not had to use. You're, you're using things. Even though that weight's not crazy, you're waking up muscle fibers that have not had to, use, uh, ha- had to activate. And that soreness level just from that right. can be where a week later you may still be feeling it. You know, so it's, it's got to be a very slow progression. We get, you know, we get folks coming into our hops class, you know, mm-hmm. Coach Heather's doing hops classes and making sure that, uh, you know, it, the classes that she does there are very much focused on total body mobility, core strength, and stuff like that. And so that's a great supplement to these, these heavier uh, sessions that we're having people do. But at the same time, the people who are kind of new to hops, Mm -hmm. you know, not a week goes by, you don't hear that I'm hitting muscles I didn't know I had prior, you know, before. And it's just because you're, you're at, you're, we're forcing activation Mm -hmm. and we're taking muscles in in your body through a bigger range of motion than you're used to. Mm -hmm. And it's forcing other muscles to work. Yep. So, which is good. That's a good thing. Which is a good thing. But you just need to be slow. With your, right. with how you progress this and keep, you know, if you're going to go heavy, do not sacrifice technique. So we did a whole another, to, we did a whole another episode on how to get into strength training without crushing yourself. Yes. I believe that's what it was called. Something like that. Um, listen so to that one. listen to that one first mm-hmm. and then come back to here and, and start working on, uh, there's some common theme. We also did running for cyclists. How to incorporate running without killing yourself? Without killing yourself. <laughs> and it, there's a common theme to this. Yeah. It's called slow progression. Right. Start easy. Start shorter. Start with less. Yeah. And build. See how the body reacts. See how the body feels before you start ramping. Don't go in session one as a hero. <laughs> and look, if you like, if you need to like find a qualified coach or personal trainer mm-hmm. to walk you through um, technique. Mm-hmm. I mean, these days with, you know, we can do sessions on Zoom and look mm-hmm. at form and correct form as we go yep. um, just to make sure you've got it down because we don't, I, I don't want to just assign, a, a lot of times we don't get to assign heavy lifting because I'm not 100% certain that person has good form mm-hmm. on even just a basic squat. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to give it to them unless I know they're comfortable with it and I'm cool with their, with their technique. Um, so we're just, we have to focus on gradual progression Mm -hmm. and making sure the technique of the exercises you adopt for your, uh, heavier lifting Mm -hmm. are sound in a like higher rep count, uh, fashion first. So if you can do those great form, you know, 10, 12 reps, Mm -hmm. that type of thing, the typical three set, 10, 12 rep. Now we can start to 
get into heavier lifting, which is typically, you know, like a, a, a three to six rep type of thing, uh, you know, and you're going to do like four to six sets of it. Let's chat just super quick about the people who are, are hearing heavy lifting and they're thinking putting on a bunch of mass. Yeah. Um, that's not going to happen. Like the, the whole point of, you know, don't get me wrong. You might gain a little weight from lifting weights, yeah. but it's good weight. And oftentimes that muscle mass displaces fat. Mm -hmm. And so you may not actually gain weight. You may just transition weight, which is what we see a lot of times. But the act of lifting heavy is not going to increase the size of the muscle fiber. Yep. It the, is the more... way you're stressing, yeah, those muscles is not for hypertrophy. It's yep. not to build muscle fiber size. Yeah, we're, we're literally more on the recruiting more muscle fibers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and making sure that those muscle fibers fire through a bigger range of motion because every muscle fires on a curve. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you are both very contracted and very stretched, those muscles are not going to fire with a lot of force. And so by going through bigger ranges of motion, we can actually have those muscles fire higher force on a bigger portion of that curve. Uh, so that's really, you know, that's kind of the big benefits of lifting heavy mm -hmm. are more in that range versus, you know, getting huge yep. looking like Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> 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 who as an athlete i appreciate you know uh in his own right but uh that's not what we're going for here that's not what we're going for if you don't know who ronnie coleman is just quick youtube yeah just look it up he's got a netflix oh, documentary the, too yeah he's he's hurting now yeah he's yeah <laughs> you can see what years and years yep and years of over pushing yourself and not taking the rest and recovery yes he even says that in the documentary that he, he, he was full gas all the time. Just always full gas. Yep. And yeah, and now he's got, what, a couple of new hips and yeah, knees and everything. Yeah. All right, so uh, yes, you should lift heavy. We talked about what it is. We talked about why. We've talked about kind of the hows. And now let's jump into favorite exercises. Yeah, so we're, we're going to not talk about anything that involves speed of the movement. Correct. So Olympic lifts. That's what you would end out. up doing right now after you're lifting heavy. Yeah, that's so the next lift phase. Heavy, then move into your next phase where you end up dropping weight some and moving weight faster. Exactly. Adding the speed element to it. Boom. Yeah. So we have we have a, a, a set that we use often that we refer to as the big three. And um, w the main one is squats. Squats build watts. I knew it was Chris coming. Watts knows all about that. Chris Watts knows squats. Well, he actually does his strength training. So bingo, bango, for, bongo. For as many improvements as he's made this season, it's it's paying off. Yep. Um, but you don't have to get like you don't have to overthink a lot of these exercises. Like you don't have to get super fancy. I mean, squat is something that I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of before. Or yep. Most people will have heard of. Um, one of the best exercises you can do. Yep. And, you know, it is, we do prefer people do it uh, free weighted and not on a machine that's yes. going to gauge your, you know, a machine is going to track you straight up and down. Yeah, like a Smith it, machine. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you, generally, if you, it takes away some of the stabilization and yep. some of the core activation that's benef you're benefiting from on mm -hmm. a squat, especially as a cyclist that is always leaned forward, front loaded, like all of the time when you're on the bike. That is very important to develop those posterior muscles that hold you up. Yep. I say it all the time in bike fits. If you're not in engaging your spinal muscles, mm -hmm. you're going to add so much weight to your hands. There's probably not a position I can put you in that's going to prevent you from getting like hand numbness and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you're not supporting any of your upper body weight with your spinal muscles. And you're going to have discomfort in the soft tissue area. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're going to put all your weight into these two contact points and it's not going to feel yeah. really comfy. I actually, I, uh, I went a month without lifting, um, before it's you know, so like end of September and I started lifting again, what last week and squats is the first, you know, main exercise that I do uh, when I lift. 
And I noticed the next day, I went light because you got to progress, right? If you're out of it, mm -hmm. it's funny how quick you lose it. But my low back, like the the spinal column, you know, muscles on the spinal column yep. were, were sore the next day. Like they were what was probably the most sore of anything. And it was just from getting back into that position and having to stabilize and keeping good technique through the whole thing. Um, you know, it wasn't a spinal issue. It was actual muscular issue. So the benefits that you get through your core in doing a lot of the exercises and especially squats is massive. Yeah. And today is the last day of squat Tober. Oh, so good thing I, I think I knocked him out better. yesterday. <laughs> this is good, good as time as any to start. Uh, so the second part of our big three are deadlifts, mm -hmm. and so um, on. Like a deadlift is basically, you know, in my opinion, actually does a better job at activating your glutes and your hip muscles than squats because so many people because you're front loaded and you have to have so much core core stabilization, a lot of people don't actually put out as much force in the lower body on a squat as they do on a deadlift. And it shows through like most people can deadlift more than they can squat if they have good form. Um, so, uh, at the same time, a deadlift, if you're lifting from the floor, a lot of times will force you to do a bigger range of motion through your hips and glutes. Yeah. Um, but again, it requires a lot of posterior, stabilization uh on the way up mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to be one of those guys that basically stands up and then lifts the whole thing with their back yep um you know which is not good form not good form at all um but you know learning to deadlift in my opinion properly is clearly one of the best uh exercises you can do as an endurance athlete just yep. as far as the number of muscles that it calls on that's what i was just going to say and the range of motion it, it, it takes you through yeah, you are activating almost every muscle group in the body when you're knocking out deadlifts. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you're, each one's going through a, a big movement pattern, yeah. but we're talking activation here. Mm -hmm. uh, number three. RDLs. Man. Those are Romanians. The, Rom the, the Romanian deadlifts. Um, these, this one is, is hard. You know, this one's made, If you've been in the strength and conditioning world, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're not... It's a little bit harder to uh, explain, mm -hmm. um, but it is basically, it's a posterior chain exercise that is, incorporates a lot of hamstring. A lot of hamstring. Um, but also, um, again, it's that, it's that stabilization from the, the, the low back, the, the pelvis, the, the uh, spinal muscles, all of that has to be in place to do, to have good form on this. Um, and, so very few lifts actually target the hamstrings more uh, unless you're doing like a glute, like a, a hamstring machine or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as a, a more complex lift, like this incorporates tons of different muscle groups, but then also puts a lot of emphasis on the hamstrings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, hamstrings are like a um a very ignored muscle in endurance athletes period mm -hmm. you know like m most endurance athletes if they're doing strength training they'll they'll do squats they'll do uh leg presses and stuff like that but will almost never ever target their hamstring mm -hmm. and as far as like cycling performance we both know from teaching pedal stroke for now 12 years mm -hmm. like you can generate a ton of force on the backside of the pedal stroke if you incorporate your hamstrings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if you're not in doing a ton of force, you're offsetting the amount of force you're having to use on the downstroke. Like being able to use hamstrings and not have them burn out and actually having them activate some. Like for a lot of folks, glutes and hammies are not activating at all. No. You know, we've had an, uh, one of our athletes specifically who just by getting his glutes to fire again, increased his sprint power what was it over 200 watts like, it was close it was to three big, close to three i mean it was a like 20 percent. and this is in a jump. this is in a 10 to 15 second all-out sprint yeah but still that's a massive jump in yeah. overall power and that was just through like rehab style mm -hmm. uh, exercises to get those muscles to fire yeah that was just waking them up and getting yeah. them to work yeah 
Um, but yeah, hamstrings, like most, most endurance athletes are going to end up being very quad dominant. Oh, yeah. And so the opposite side of that uh, muscle group is your hamstrings. So we don't want to be neglecting hamstrings. So, uh, or, or the muscular imbalance is going to get even worse and injuries are going to become a big issue. Yeah. A lot of people with low back problems, you know, a lot of times it's hamstring related. Mm-hmm. Um, or low backs trying to do the work of the hamstring because the glute and the hamstring aren't firing. So yep. now you're trying to trying to activate through low back what should be a, a glute hammy uh, movement um, and activation. So yeah, when you're when doing you're, those and keeping them awake is is huge, and then you know getting them to to fire more forcefully is even better. Yeah, a lot of times when the glutes aren't working properly the the you know it'll just move up the chain to Mm -hmm. to finish that hip extension off Mm -hmm. and your low back's the next one pretty much usually it usually comes in and that's when people run into all kinds of low back issues and it also is a you know can be the result of like we see a lot of uh high hamstring injuries in in running and stuff like that and it's mainly because your glutes aren't doing any or enough work uh, Mm -hmm. when they should be Mm -hmm. uh, for the movements that you're doing so probably a good time to transition into our next exercise yeah so this one is the goofiest looking but possibly the most targeted glute uh, exercise and it is like there's a ton of names for it uh the weighted hip thrusters and it's become like this huge thing like i feel like Every time I see a uh, like an Instagram post or something from a, uh, a a sport performance guy who's working with like NFL and and, and like baseball, yeah. they're always it's like always this exercise. Yeah. And basically, it looks like an air hump. We they, just I mean, lost we just lost our PG rating. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you put your back on a bench and you put uh, you can put like a barbell or something at yep. your hip level. Yeah. And so, like a lot of people use pads and stuff. You know, so it doesn't dig into your hip bones, but you're soft. Uh, yeah, you're soft. <laughs> um, but you're, you know, you you're basically seated with your back on a uh, a bench, and then you push your hips up as yeah, high as feet, you can. Feet on the ground, back on the bench. Yeah, you're pushing through your heels and getting your hip hips up as high as you can, and that is like the ultimate hip extension mm-hmm. exercise. It, it takes out a lot of the other. Uh, extraneous movements that would happen if you were just doing a squat or a deadlift and it focused solely on on hip extension and yep. glute activation yep. uh, and for for people like um, in these sports because your glutes are so powerful and so fatigue resistant as compared to your quads like um, we have to use them we got to use them mm-hmm. so hip thrusters I've started anybody who I coach who's been lifting heavy is hip thrusters they're getting them um and i I always put in there i don't i'm not putting this in there for the funny looks i'm (laughs) i'm (laughs) I'm putting it in there because it's good yeah all right so that covers pretty much the a lot of the lower body stuff you know a lot of the stuff activates total body but focuses more on low body action so the next four we're going to give you um are, are working more upper body and and like a lot of people ask like do I as a, do I need to do upper body? And to my question is, uh, do you want to look like Andy Schleck? <laughs> <laughs> you or, know who that is? Or, uh, you're missing out. Or, <laughs> Google it. I could do another one of most recent. Uh, yeah. Uh, any pro tour cyclist? Yeah. Any pro tour cyclist? Yeah. Uh, but you know, for the most part, again, there are some great benefits to doing the heavier lifting on the upper body as well. Let's go back to bone density yeah. for you cyclists that don't want to do it. Um, yeah, if you've ever blown out your collarbone, uh, there's a there's a you have a far less risk of doing so mm-hmm. if not only the bones are prepared, but also the muscles surrounding the joints mm-hmm. are prepared to do some protection. Yep. Oh, for sure. Uh, you don't have to have massive muscles to protect the bones and the joints. Yep. Uh, but they have to be prepared to switch on really quickly Mm -hmm. if you do in in fact hit the deck Mm -hmm. yeah and and even besides the the bone density uh helping increase bone density just from an injury prevention standpoint in general like actually 
working your muscles through and your joints through that larger range of motion. You know, so many exactly. of us sit at a desk or we sit in our car, we sit and look at our cell phones yep. and we're rolled and now we've got you know joints that are locking down, we've got muscles that are turning off. Uh, which are going to lead to neck issues and shoulder issues and you know nagging pains uh, along the way. Um, so just working your upper body and turning muscle groups back on and going through this good range of motions huge. That was another another point I was going to make with with protecting like in preventing injury is that doing a lot of the upper body and building some of the musculature in your upper neck and shoulders. Uh, if you hit your head on the ground, and this is like a huge thing in NFL right now is, mm-hmm. is making sure these guys neck is super strong so that if they take an impact to the head, that their, their neck muscles are prepared to like soak up some of that impact. And it's the same, it would be the same thing if you hit the, hit your head on the, you know, mm-hmm. see that wreck from yesterday's stage of the Vuelta, uh, dude's helmet, back of his helmet blew off basically, uh, you know, and I don't know how they let him keep going, but he, apparently he was okay. Like the docs checked him out. He didn't have any, he must have not had any, <laughs> he must have not the had any. protocol might be a little loose in the uh, <laughs> cycling world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyways, uh, you know, doing that and, and with, you know, there are instances where um, people who are doing like ultra cycling and stuff like that end up with a Sherman's neck. Yeah, like a, a, a Sherman's neck where they like can't even actually hold their head up anymore yeah. uh, on a, a long endurance ride like that. Or you know, we have seen you know blown out discs and and uh, people yeah. needing fusions and stuff like that mm-hmm. um, from just being bent forward and having to hold their head up for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you do the strength work and prepare those muscles. You have far less, far, far, far less risk of having any anything like that happening. Yeah, which can derail your training. Yeah, which is you know a big performance inhibitor. Is Clearly. if you can't train, then uh, you're on the bench. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of bench, we haven't even Speaking gotten to the next yes, exercise. So that was a long plug as yeah. to why you should do upper body, um, but it's important. Like we stress this all the time. Like we, one of the hardest things it is for us to get our athletes to do is the strength training side of things. Yeah. So uh the fact that we're diving into why a little bit more yeah um, i think is important Man, so fun so we're killing it on segments today bench <laughs> our segues are on point bench <laughs> uh, <laughs> sitting on the bench so with a bench you know bench press or a dumbbell bench you know preferably you know there's plenty of weights on that on that dumbbell rack to go heavy yep. uh doing dumbbell bench you just a lot of people will need a, a, a little bit more of a spot you're gonna need a spot anyways if you're mm-hmm. doing heavy but uh, to get the the two dumbbells up to start the lift exactly um but i prefer dumbbell bench personally because it forces you to stabilize right and left side um even if you're doing it heavy and also like with dumbbell bench as a um you, you like it because you get to throw the weights on the ground i was getting to that point <laughs> clang, clang, clang. if if you do get to failure <laughs> you can just drop them you, it's hard. It's much harder to like. You can't drop a be, a barbell that's above your face. We don't recommend dropping. The I've barbell. had it. I've oh, had yeah. it happen before. That's where you don't put the collars on, you just let one side go and then the other. I had it. I was <laughs> random story real quick. I was in high school and was doing. I used to do thumb behind the bar. Oh man! And I had it up, and for some reason, uh, like I had a wrist twitch, and my wrist twitch, and I shot that bar off off, and it it was like. 210 pounds that came down basically on my chest and then rolled back to my throat. And luckily I had somebody standing there yeah. to like help, but like it could have been bad. I would much rather, you know, toss dumbbells and have people look at me funny than, uh, you know, yeah. have another bar dropped on my neck. Personally, I'm more of a barbell fan yeah. and mine is because I actually have a shoulder issue that my, my shoulder will want to come out of socket. And so if I try to go heavy or if it, sometimes it's like just if something, it'll try to just slip out. But with a barbell, I'm able to keep stability through my shoulder. Yeah. I mean, it is two different, a little bit different range of motion. You can go a little bit deep, like a big, little bit deeper range of motion with the dumbbells. Mm-hmm. But um, at the same time, I always was accused of cheating uh, because I have short arms. Yeah. Gator <laughs> arms over here. Oh, gator arm. <laughs> 
We'll have to bring back our uh, bench press uh, competition again. Yeah, we did that one yeah. time. All right, so press exercise. So anytime you do a press, so we're pressing forward, yeah. we also want to do a pull. Yeah, so we're talking about horizontal, we just mainly talked. a horizontal press. We're going to do a horizontal pull. And the pull is huge. So like something that's getting you to retract shoulders and yeah. work the backside of that upper body is, is huge. It counteracts a lot of this yeah. shoulder forward. I'm driving, I'm at the office, I'm watching, you know, playing on my cell phone position that you find yourself in that slouch position. So doing this horizontal pull exercise is great for actually engaging and waking up muscles that, uh, that should be working as opposed to you trying to take everything through your neck. Yeah. Yeah. So bent over rows are my, my favorite mm -hmm. again, because it's a similar, uh, it's a similar position, a front loaded position, like an RDL. So you are having to do a lot of posterior chain stabilization when you're doing the exercise. Um, but it is a, you know, you can get a really good range of motion with it. And, um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're calling on tons of mm -hmm. different muscle groups in your back. Ton I mean, of core activation. Yeah. I mean, and, and you're essentially simulating, you know, for the cyclist, you're simulating the position you would be in on the bike. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And that, and again, that much support in that position mm -hmm. breeds comfort on the bike. Yeah. Breeds being able to power put power down in an arrow position uh if you want to be you know get in a super aggressive you know tt position it, you know you're not gonna i mean, i just don't think you're gonna get there for most people unless you're doing a lot of posterior chain stabilization and mm -hmm. core exercises but and something to be aware of like as as you go if you're doing you know every single one of these exercises in a training session you're going to start developing some muscular fatigue through that core and through that posterior chain. So just be careful with, you know, like something like a bent over row that it's very easy to disengage that posterior chain, mm -hmm. disengage your glutes, yeah, disengage your, your ham hamstrings, disengage the quads, and now your low back takes it all. So if you're trying to go heavier in a bent over row later on in a, uh, in a training session, be sure that you're putting a lot of that stability through that through that low body and activating through those. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't go from still. an RDL to a bent over row. No. Put something in between. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and if you need to go to a machine row, like I prefer a bent over row as well, but if you need to go to something like a machine row that's more Yeah. um uh, take some strain off the or some stress off the the low body and yep. low back, go ahead. Uh so uh so vertical push pull or sorry, horizontal push horizontal. pull. Let's go vertical push pull. Um Shoulder press. Arnold's. Arnold press. You like the Arnold press? I like the Arnold's. Or you can even go like a curl to press. You know, some people like yeah, to you can go get complex more done with at it. one point. Uh, one, I like to time. do the behind the head like military press um, because it helps increase that range of motion and mobility through the shoulders. So like if you did want to take it to another level and go to something like an overhead squat or, uh, you know, end up doing snatch or something like that, like you, like that is a precursor exercise uh but you're also again because you're um because you are pushing from behind the head you're incorporating a ton of different muscle groups mm -hmm. in your in your upper back and and even in some of the, like traps and neck muscles that are are needing that support from the posterior of your body now we we mentioned form and technique like for people that don't have the shoulder mobility that try to go to that yeah like if they try to incorporate that right away especially if they try to add weight it's really easy to jack yourself up you know start dropping your chin and rolling your back and trying yeah. to do whatever you can to be able to clear your head um so you got to be very aware and make sure that shoulder mobility is there first yeah. prior to trying to to load up any weight on something like that last one last one vertical pull vertical pull either a pull up or a lat pull down yeah. so either way so essentially you know hands are moving up and down um you know with with a pull up your body is the resistance so you're resisting gravity with a lat pull down you're secured and now you're pulling weight um Essentially, you're pulling weight up as you pull the bar down. So it's this, yep. it's a similar movement pattern. Ooh, pain train. Similar movement pattern, 
Um, but yeah, we're working a different plane. So there's a lot of different planes your body can work through. We've already worked the horizontal on the push pull. Yep. Now we're working, um, you know, that vertical plane. Yep. Um, I will say too, I will say if you are doing lat pulls and you're going heavy, don't be that person at the gym who's like, putting their entire body into a lat pull. <laughs> lean, lean, basically what they end up doing is they lean back so far that it turns into a horizontal pull. Yeah. Uh, stay straight up. Yeah, you accelerate the weight with don't, your body yeah, weight don't get and the, then pull. Yeah, yeah, don't like stand up and then sit down and start to pull. <laughs> don't do like the guy who's jumping up and down uh -huh. like doing his lap pull. Just in one place. Let the lats do the job. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, pull your shoulder blades, retract your shoulder blades, pull those into into the gig, and yep. uh, yeah, stay controlled with your movements. Control technique. So, Always keep the technique because as soon as you get away from technique to go heavier, you're likely not going to be working or firing the muscle groups you should when you should. Yeah. And so now it's negating the whole purpose of this sort of uh, workout. So real quick. We kind of went through the how, we went through the exercises. Um, so people are gonna, I know people are gonna ask like, how often should we lift heavy? Um, generally for an endurance athlete, this is kind of where it differs from other uh, sports. Uh, I usually have my athlete, because we have, look, we're, we're real people where we have limited time and it's harder to get people to do the, the stuff that's not swimming, biking or running. So I usually don't go over once a week. There are cases uh, of people that I do have lifting twice a week uh, over the over the fall uh, and winter off season. Lifting heavy, that is. Yeah, not, sorry, lifting not heavy. Only lifting. Yeah, lifting heavy yeah. twice a week. But generally, what we see is we'll do a heavy session and then we'll do another session that's more geared toward mobility uh, and total Range body. Motion, yeah, know, yeah, and, auxiliary work. Yeah, a lot more core more lateral movement like none of this yeah. stuff incorporated lateral movement yeah so that's something you would do in a, in yes. a separate session a lot of sure. stabilization lateral movement um and then if also if like with with that that session could also turn into for those that get to that point could turn into more of a uh like power production mm -hmm. session like plyometric mm -hmm. and stuff like that which is a whole nother topic we won't get into today Please don't um, start with plyometrics before you've built some strength. Yeah. Was, <laughs> plyometrics are not, are, it's, it's not it's conditioning. It's a conditioning tool. It's a conditioning not, tool. No. Okay. Anyways. Um, so that's it. That's pretty much, you know, generally you'll get a heavy set once a week. Uh, there are several people who will lift, you know, heavy twice a week. Um, yeah, for cyclists, it's going to be easier than for, right. you know, triathlete, yeah, 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 triathlete good point. who's getting, you know, nine sessions yeah. on swim bike run if you're a possibly. single sport athlete you could probably sneak in another heavy session pretty easily mm -hmm. uh and then do more of a more mobility core focused session as well yeah um but yeah i mean that's there is as we've rambled on at this point uh a ton of benefits to heavy lifting yeah and this is the time of year to do it you know winter through the winter time for cyclists yeah. especially uh is the time to do it it's okay to have some soreness, it's okay to take focus away from your cycling for a while um, and scale back on that in order to put strength training as a priority. It's going to set a foundation for next year, for your season, for you to be healthier and stronger and um, better able to perform. So yeah. make it happen. You're, you're going to be sore. You're going to be sore. Even if you go light. Honestly, go light yeah. because you'll still be sore going light to start with. Yeah. But the, th the problem is that people mostly, they get sore and they're like, screw this. Not I'm not doing, doing it. it because it's affecting my other workouts. Yep. Get through it. Get through that four to six week period where you're going to be sore all the time. Yep. And then, you know, when you get heavy, you're going to get sore again. And just, this is the time to do it. And you, it pays off. It's going to pay off 10 times more than those junk miles you're putting in mm -hmm. uh, elsewhere. And you, your goal should be to... to for year after year after year, many years from now, be a functional human being. Like if you okay. just let imbalances stack up year after year after year, at some point it's going to catch up to you. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be 
you know, 65 years old and uh, immobile because you've neglected strength training for so long, like get going with it now. It's never too late to start. Um, in fact, we work with people who started their strength training in their 60s um, who are hitting, you know, PRs uh, across the board. So it's not too late to start. Um, slow progression your most soreness is going to come your first session, even more so than it will be going from general prep to heavy. You'll be more sore going from zero to general prep. So just be super, super yep. cognizant of that and keep it chill. For sure. How's the horse? <laughs> is it dead? Is it dead yet? I think it's been beaten. Okay. I think we beat that horse. In- <laughs> <laughs> the final breath. All right. Well, we, we appreciate everyone no one said we aren't long-winded hanging out listening watching we'll catch you guys next time peace adios